As I ring this bowl, let's relax into this common time and space. We'll realize that we need to be together. We yearn for connection, the familiar faces of friends, and the sound of shared voices. For our prelude today, something a little different, please welcome back some barking.
Jim's presentation will also be available on Zoom. Unfortunately, we have not yet resolved the issue of getting light hors d'oeuvres out over <laughs> I have no other announcements, although much of the service today will include announcements. And if there are no other announcements, I don't see any, we will move right on to the chapel slide. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sure everybody's awake here. We never thought this today would feel warm, but it is. This morning we light our chalice as a symbol of all creation. I, I invite you to join me in the words that are in your order of service. We light this chalice as a symbol of the light within all creation. We light this chalice for truth. May the search for truth be with us always. We light this chalice for love. May the love be ours be strong in our hearts. So we're singing a familiar hymn today, and Jan, we're doing it twice, right? Mike? Doing it twice. To, all the way through twice, and Michael Casey will be is our accompanist today for the hymns. Michael. Please rise in body or spirit. Spirit of Life 123. <laughs> So what changed that allows so much more open discussion 
we can talk about money now, certainly more than in 1993 when that hymnal was published. And why were we so uncomfortable when one member of my old Annapolis congregation wanted to publicize a list of everyone's commitment for the year? <laughs> yeah, this is the same reaction. <laughs> we didn't even talk about salaries then, as Sue told me. And in fact, we still don't. <clears throat> But I can't say for certain what society, but wait a minute, I, said, I can't say for certain that society generally is now much more open about everything. We are open about sexual orientation, about racial justice, and even financial issues. But I can say that there is a welcome openness now that fosters the discussion of these topics, including the stewardship program that Jackie Mathwich is in charge of, that, uh, that Sue is going to talk about more, and the budget that Jim Lavin will have a complete explanation for after the coffee hour. So I encourage each of you to attend, participate, learn more about our UUCR finances and the budget for the coming year and remember, it was not always so transparent. So now we're pleased to announce the recipient of this month's Social Justice Outreach Collection, <clears throat> Sumner Hall. And I think with us today is Barbara Foster to, there she is, to explain more about Sumner Hall's activities. So come right on up here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. First, let me thank you as a congregation and as individuals for the support that you have given to Sumner Hall through the years. We are most appreciative of your uh, generosity. Um, Sumner Hall was an abandoned building uh, less than 20 years ago. And in the past 10 years, it has grown into a social organization that is based on the values of the founders who were 28 African-American soldiers returning from the Civil War who joined the Grand Army of the Republic the veterans organization of the day. And our mission is to honor their service to this community uh, by being involved in three areas of interest. First is to support African-American veterans. Uh, and currently at Sumner Hall, we have an exhibition that honors the nearly 2,000 African-Americans from Kent County who served in various uh, military operations from the, from the Revolutionary War onwards. Our second initiative has to do with spreading the word and action of African American culture and history in our community. And we do this in several ways, um, one of which is to focus on education for children. And we have a library of uh, uh, almost a thousand volumes of children's books uh, that we share in the school systems in, on the Eastern Shore. Uh, we also have just received a collection of memorabilia that was found in an attic of a, of a, of a uh, home that was going to be uh, torn down. And this is called the Commodore Collection. And thankfully we have received some federal and state funding to create an exhibit and a book about uh, the stories that are in that uh, collection. <clears throat> so this is our project this year. Um, and uh, also along that vein, um, we are uh, trying to find ways in the next year to take an exhibition of this material around the county and throughout the Eastern Shore, schools and libraries, public and private schools, so that is one of our, our activities for the upcoming year. Uh, our, one of the things we did after that was to publish the story of Henry Highland Burnett. 
uh, a coloring book for younger kids and a chapter book for uh, elementary school children. And there'll be a book coming out of the Commodore collection work as well. And in March, uh, we will be going to Garnett School to do a special presentation and to which you all are invited. And as I understand, there are several folks who are willing to volunteer at that project and there's information about that on the table at the door. I think. <laughs> the last thing that we're involved in, although not least important, um, is our social action and social justice initiative. Uh, so we've done a couple of things in this regard and continue the work. One, uh, we are we support the work of the Social Action Committee for Racial Justice by being their fiscal manager. Uh, secondly, uh, we are working uh, to promote the understanding of social inequity and racial inequity through the James Taylor Justice Coalition, mm -hmm. whose co-chairman is Phil Dutton of this congregation. Uh, and we will be holding our third annual Justice Day celebration in May of this year. Um, so uh, in one of the outgrowths of that um, was the soil collection ceremony that we did last year. And your congregation was most supportive of our bus trip that we took to Alabama, where the soil from the place where James Taylor was hanged uh, joins all, um, big jars of soil from other places around the country. Um, and so uh, this serves as a reminder uh, to the fact that uh, lynching is not something of the past. So once again, we thank you very much for your support uh, and we look forward to seeing you at Sumner Hall and at some of our activities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We had the chance to see the presentation jointly with the Presbyterian Church that Philip had put together too. And very, very nice. I highly recommend it if you get another chance. We'll now prepare for the offertory this morning. And for contributions to Sumner Hall, please make out your checks to UUCR and identify Sumner Hall in the memo line. And of course, those of you Zooming, or if you're online later, you can always donate online by hitting the donate button and entering custom amount Sumner Hall in the comment section. And thank you for being generous. And now Sum Larkin will provide us generous music. <laughs> Sunday and we're talking about money. We did that because we think we have the emotional and generosity capacity to hold all those places of giving together. And I also noticed that lovely offertory music, Centered Love. 
And in that spirit, I offer our time for centering this morning. Spirit of life, spirit of love, holy mystery. May we hear the voices of the past mingled with the voices of today, guiding us into the future, into our own becoming with purpose and principle toward liberation for all people with love as our common calling. Let us hold love at the center. May we continue to cherish the earth with humility and reverence, honoring our place in the independent web. Let us hold love at the center. May we celebrate all sacred beings, diverse in culture and theology, learning from one another and embracing difference in our search for truth and meaning. Let us hold love at the center. May we keep reaching for belovedness, for diverse multicultural community, far from the collect for the collective thriving of all people, where all voices are heard. And as we work to dismantle racism and all forms of oppression, let us hold love at the center. May we cultivate a spirit of generosity, of gratitude and hope, freely and compassionately sharing our faith, our presence, our resources, centering connection and relationships of mutuality. Let us hold love at the center. These are words from one of my colleagues, Sarah Lowell. Let's just take a moment in quiet. Picture the ways in your life, the life of this congregation, that we work to hold love at the center. Let us keep love at the center now and always. Okay. For the acknowledgments of the heart, I will light a candle for you while you come to the microphone to share your joy or concern. But first, as we regularly do, I will light a candle for all of the victims of COVID which remains troublingly active, and the healthcare workers getting us through it. Also, for the many people who are suffering the effects of rampant gun violence in this country, as well as the brave people of Ukraine as they fight for their survival. So, for these and the many unspoken joys and concerns held in our hearts, let's have a period of silence. So be it. Our next hymn is out of the Teal Hymn, number 1031. Uh, we'll only sing one verse. I think we'll sing all the verses, but just all one. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I think we know it, but we'll, it'll be a test.
So based on the theme of stewardship today, we're going to talk a little bit about paths. There's an author, Robert McFarlane, who I was not familiar with. He's in his mid-40s, lives in Britain, and he has spent what he's had of his lifetime so far, far walking across the well-worn paths of Britain. He's also gone to, to Spain and Palestine, and by his own measures, he's logged about seven to 8,000 miles so far. The paths he walks on are generally footpaths rather than paved roads, and he wrote a book, it's called The Old Ways, A Journey on Foot. He shares that this is the way he's come to think about paths. Paths are the habits of a landscape. Paths connect. This is their first duty and their chief reason for being. They relate places in a literal sense. They, they connect their paths. And by extension, they relate people. It's interesting to read his prose. He, he walked, he's walked on very ancient paths that have been sort of the highways going through parts of Europe for ages and not so ancient paths. He says he feels as he walks down these paths connected to those who have used the path before him. He says he literally tingles. You ever have that feeling when you're going back to a homeland or someplace where your grandparents or great grandparents may have lived and you go, they walked on this street. Picture paths. Paths can help, help me imagine this. They can take many forms. And the paths I picture, probably because I've grown up predominantly in the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast, I picture a path going through trees. I picture the trees somehow being just wide enough that the where you go is obvious. I'm always grateful that somebody, some people, if you do a little hiking around here, whether you're in Tuckermans or Adkins or different places, have put those little splotches on the trees. You go, thank gosh, there's another light blue or red splotch. The other thing I think about paths is the edges. Unlike a really clear sidewalk, the edges are often a bit fuzzy. There's something worn into the trail. What are the paths that you picture? Maybe it's a path through farmland or, or beach grasses. Maybe it's the path of a well-used well channel in the sea that has to be dredged out now and then. Maybe it's the front walkway up to your door. For McFarland, a lot of the paths were along that sort of rocky hillside you see. You see it a lot of the BBC, BBC shows. You see the, the paths that have the rock paths going through. Well, the dictionary describes path as a trodden way or a track constructed for a specific use. Here's the thing about paths is they get used over and over. And it's with the use that they become easier and easier to use. McFarland describes paths as acts of consensual making. It's hard to create a footpath on your own. You just walk through someplace once, it's not going to last. So our stewardship team, Jackie, Catherine, Joy, and Peggy, chose to center widening the path, welcoming all as the theme for this year's pledge drive. And for folks that aren't familiar, that's the way pledge drives is just how we collect and we get folks to commit to how much they're gonna give for next year. So we start thinking about paths that we don't create alone. And for this congregation this year, there has been a literal sense of path. For folks that aren't familiar with the story, I don't know, 10 years or so ago, a memorial garden was built down this hill. You don't think it's a big hill going down until you try to navigate walking down there. And there's been a project headed by Jim Lavin and others to say, how are we going to better connect this building, our church home, with the memorial garden because we realized a couple of things as we started to use the garden more it's hard to get there it doesn't look like much grass but it's uneven it gets wet it's lumpy so if you picture our literal path that we are creating 
We're doing that to make this a more welcoming place and to make it more functional. And that's all under control. That's not the whole purpose at all by any means of the pledge drive, but we're making intentional decisions to create a path. So why would we want to widen the whole path in this congregation? Sort of what were Jackie and Joy and Catherine and Peggy thinking when they came up with this topic that you have to create a sermon around? So there's the physical connections. But we can also think of other ways we use the term path in our life. We have career paths. We have the path of our relationship. And often when somebody walks in our greeting team, Diane and others, we ask visitors who come through those doors, what brought you here this morning? It's amazing how often people then share a path that their life has taken that brought them to us doors. What I really appreciated in McFarland's observation that paths are about connection and aren't created alone is how true that feels both for physical paths and for the trajectory of our lives. We head out, those edges are murky. We wonder about those who have traveled before. How did musicians find a path from your earliest skills? How did you end up here presenting, doing paid gigs? What about the path of parenting, the path of ministry? There was a story that McFarland included in his book about something that was done in the 19th century. There's all these paths that are running through England, and on a couple of the more well-used paths, there would be a post, and they would put a small hook. It was actually a little sickle. They would hang at one end of the post. And as you used the path, you could pick up that hook and you could do a little clearing of the branches that had been growing in, making that path harder to use because paths take energy to care for. And when you cut to the other end, there was a place to hang the hook as you continued your path. Somebody then might pick it up and use it for a <laughs> path. We need to keep our paths into this congregation. We need to keep the paths of our life safe and clear Maybe now and then I'm picturing somebody would use those little sickles and they would actually widen the path, imagining new ways you might use the path. Maybe you needed to get tools down the path. You needed a way for people to travel walking together. It's a beautiful image to consider as we think about this coming year, maybe decades ahead. What will help us keep wide paths to this congregation Who's going to tend to the paths? So that's the place we were invited to this path of welcome. And boldly we're asked in the, the message that the stewardship team gave us is to welcome all. We talk about that, but is it really that easy? I recall being in about first grade. I was thinking about this and I always lived in suburban areas. And I learned, I think as I was at the end of first grade, that the bigger kids, somehow I managed to live in a house of 20 split levels with something like 95 kids my father counted at some point, it was the mid 50s, very prolific time. But the big kids had a secret way that they walked to school. There was just this small patch of woods and the opening to the short path you had to know about. It was only about two feet wide you needed to be in. You needed to know when to duck off the sidewalk at that spot. Using a narrow path was sort of a badge of honor. It was that insider knowledge. You were getting close to second grade. It was a time to be cool. But it was a path that there wasn't really anyone that wanted to widen. If we widened it, then others, adults, little kids, would mess things up. I think in life, we are sometimes reluctant. We say we want to widen paths. We say we want to welcome all. And yet we don't use those sickles to keep the path wider and wider. Our hearts tell us to go for it. Sometimes those actions lag a bit behind. Because when we access and we create more access by creating wider paths, we invite change. If it's a really sincere welcome, to all, 
we are inviting folks to come as their authentic selves and we drop any expectations that they are going to conform to our secret path societies. In widening the path with our doors open, there is a readiness to broaden our reach. And we are living out as Unitarian Universalists our values of inclusion and our values of generosity. And generosity is about that financial part that Jan talked about, but it's, a lot, it's about a lot more to live into a value of generosity, to be a generous spirit. What does that take? There's a social worker, Judith Connor, Connor, and she writes about a generous spirit this way. A generous spirit is an openness and a willingness to share our material, our emotional, our spiritual, and our intellectual gifts with others. It's beyond charitable giving and volunteerism. Generosity of spirit can be defined in a way of authentically engaging with the world, free from fear, dropping envy, and small-mindedness. A generous spirit requires us to go beyond just mere tolerance to a genuine embracing of the other. It's taking the risk to be known and to know others and to stand ready to even sacrifice for what matters to you most. In other words, having a true spirit of generosity will often and perhaps always mean choosing the high road over the path of least resistance. Think about that. What does it mean to live into that value of generosity? To take the risks of letting people see you and see your needs and see who you really are and to see them. I think that is authentic welcome. And Connors goes on to say this about generous spirits. The good news is that none of us can attain or even seek a generous spirit without also serving and sustaining our own emotional, emotional and mental well-being. It's not just about giving and giving and giving until you're dry. It's about living a life where you're not afraid to both receive and to give. She goes on, with each day that we live a life informed by purpose rather than ease, when we live generously, we come a few steps closer to the lives we are called upon to live. And it's on that journey then that we find what it is to really be happy. It's this tie of living this generous place, of not being tight, of not being worried, of not holding back in scarcity, that allows joy, that allows happiness. And this community right here, I know we have a few guests here today, but this community right here, UUCR, is a community packed with just such generous spirits. This is a path this congregation has been on for many years. It's a path, this path of generosity that has carried you through COVID and recent losses. It's a path that helps you laugh and care. When I call somebody in this congregation and ask them to participate in an activity or to answer a question or to brainstorm some decision or dilemma I'm having, inevitably the response is welcoming. There may be somebody, there's times we have to say, no, I can't do it right now. But call me later. Maybe I can help you then. It's invigorating to be the minister of this congregation because energy is contagious. You are just an amazing congregation. You trust one another. When you somehow imagine this future together, you build paths that will be used for generations to come, literally and figuratively. And I think you somehow trust that you'll figure out the challenges that will come, because they will. A generous mindset is one that trusts in the abundance of life. It's about a trust that there is enough to go around. There is enough care, enough ingenuity, enough resources. In summary, there is enough love. It is not a finite resource. In a community of generous spirits, it's when we lean into these connections. We talked about paths connecting one another. And when we lean into the connections, we are moved and we are able 
to give care, to give ideas, and to give money. We trust the community enough to receive as well. I think that's actually one of the harder parts of being a community of generous spirits is what happens when you're the one who needs to receive. How hard is that? But it takes us doing both. It's not transactional. It's not that if you give, you'll get more, etc. It's about a life outlook of sharing. It's about walking next paths as a community together, which circles that me back to why you want to widen the path. My hope, my hope is that there are many out there looking for belonging and spiritual homes and the paths of this beautiful community of generous spirits will be easy to get through. You'll make it easy for others to find their way because the place will be well tended, it will be well cared for. But it goes beyond those who aren't here yet. My hope is that for those of you who are here in person or virtually, the paths toward your next level of engagement are as brightly lit. That you are seeing how you can engage more deeply and how this congregation can be a part of your life. That when you're ready for a next spiritual path or you need care or you want to try some new role, we've made it easy for you to do that. Those are the paths into the community. Those are the paths among us. But here's the path that I think you are continually creating. It's the path into the world that emanates from the core of the generous spirits who are here. I imagine these as wide paths. You don't know where they're going to take us into community where we live out values of love and compassion and equity. I imagine walking those paths often in pairs, often in small groups, into some part of the unknown as we listen well in the community, as we build partnerships and we gear up to speak courageously about what could be. But then we take the path back. We offer our service, but we know the paths back into this core are well tended. In a community of generous spirits, there is the shared vision of welcoming all. And the annual pledge drive is your chance to invest in these values. You may be building the paths for those we have not yet met and almost certainly are. But what the pledges do is they help us assure a continued presence in this amazing community of generous spirits and make sure that the doors truly are open for all. Without a moment, you're going to hear from Catherine, a member of the stewardship team, about this, this year's invitation. <clears throat> for me, I thank you deeply for being a place of welcome for this minister, for being a place of welcome and care, because the Unitarian Universalists of the Chester <clears throat> River matter today and will matter in the future in ways you can barely imagine. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I came to this church a couple of years ago. Um, I watched the YouTubes at home with John Ramsey and Cynthia Ramsey, and then I started coming to the church. And it wasn't long before um, people started asking me to get involved in the church itself. And the stewardship committee was something that was kind of short term. And I thought, okay, I can handle that. I'm not asking me to commit for months and months and months. So I became a member of the stewardship committee. And one of the things that I really like about that committee is <clears throat> we operate very collaboratively. We recognize each other's strengths and we use those strengths and we call on each other. So that's given back to me a connection with the church and a connection with individual people in the church so I get to know them. So the question is, why do people like it here? What is it about this church that makes it unique? So as I was standing around, as people were coming in, I asked people that very question. It's like, why do you like this church? Is this church any different than any other church? And it was fascinating to hear the answers. 
Number one was the people. Absolutely the people. I mean, I got like seven votes out of eight for the people. <laughs> and, and I said, okay, what is it about the people? Well, they're very accepting of wherever you're coming from and new members and old members and ideas. The other thing is that people are happy here. We do have our joys and concerns, but basically people are happy and energetic and wanting to do things, not only for each other, but in the community. So the social action part is another strong attractor to this community. People are not just sitting here once a week, they're saying, okay, I want to be more involved out of the community. And this church gives the structure to do that. Another one is the music. We don't just have the regular choir or the regular <laughs> piano player. We bring in a variety of musicians. And I like that. I like that it's always mixed up. You never quite know what's going to happen with the music. However, we're finding really quality music. We're a little town. And there's some folks here that really have some talents that are willing to share them. So I appreciate that. The other part is that for me, thinking about stewardship, um, I have never pledged to a church before in my life. I'm not a you know really high level churchgoer, um, but I participated in Unitarian churches and other places where I've lived. But I've never really made the commitment. And when I first became a member, um, it was pretty clear to me that I was going to do that. And it was pretty clear to me that it wasn't going to be a $10 a week kind of thing. It was going to be a chunk from my perspective of what's a chunk. Um, and I thought about that and I said, well, why am I doing that? And I realized that I get a lot back from this church. Um, I was pretty sick earlier in the spring and summer and people wrote to me, wrote cards to me, Sue called me, people in the congregation came up to me and asked me how I was doing. Um, it was astounding to me how much that community really pays attention to the members and give to us when we need it, we celebrate when we want to, we have bonfires and hot locks, and it's not just to come in once a week for an hour kind of place. The other thing about this <clears throat> church to me, and it goes back to some of what Sue was saying, is this sanctuary, the physical sanctuary, and this service once a week is a place to hold the values that we have. One person actually said it's a sanctuary from reality, <laughs> that we come in here and the rest of the world's kind of out there, but in here, we're just kind of being family and enjoying each other. And you have to pay for that. You really do. You know, we have to pay for this sanctuary. We have to pay for a new furnace. We want to pay for a new pathway. And it does take money. So that's what we're asking you to do, is to pick up your pledge packet today. And if you want to make that commitment today, great. If you want to think about it, and mail in your pledge card. That's what we really like. Um, and so think about what the church gives to you and what do you want to use the church for in your life? And I say use in a friendly kind of way. I don't mean abuse the church, but I mean, what, what can the church give to you so that you can give back? And our budget is open. And I think that's pretty cool. You can see exactly where your money goes. And whether it's to a committee and you can find out what that committee is doing, whether it's to the pathway or the new heating system or a new um, accessible door, all of those things are pretty clear in the budget. So I encourage you after the service today to participate in our, what, what um, we call, Jan called them light orders. I started out as blunt, and I said, no, it's not much. <laughs> and he said, last week they talked about uh, generous orders or high orders, and I said, no, it's not that either. <laughs> so he said light orders today, and that's probably more appropriate. But our purpose in the order is to invite you to stay to hear the budget. And it's not going to be a long presentation, but it gives you the opportunity to know where our money goes. 
And so please stay after the service, after you've had your snacks, and do the usual mingling that we do here, and then pledge to the church. Help us keep holding our place where these values and feelings can be comfortable <clears throat> and accepting. And now we have music. Extinguish the chalice today. After we'll do closing words and we'll extinguish the chalice. We leave today renewed in our commitment to love. We leave grateful for the generous spirits that are the foundation of this congregation. We leave trusting faith. We trust that yes, there is enough. Go in peace. Go in love. Go knowing love surrounds you wherever you may go. I invite everyone to share in our chalice extinguish the words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light and truth, the warmth of community, nor the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we meet again.
You're invited to go snack away and put big, big numbers on whatever sheet they hand you. 